Welcome them to church this morning. It is a beautiful Sunday morning, and we are glad you are here in the house this morning. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. We've got a few things. I, I, that's right. When I, when I get ready to speak, you need to be ready to get back in your chair. I could say that. That's my wife. So, uh, no. No. When you came in this morning, you should have found a connect card uh, in, the, in the seat around you. That is our way that we would love to connect with you. There, on the back of that connect card is a great place for you to put any prayer requests that you may have or praise reports that you may have. Our church loves to pray with and for you, and, and those get collected and sent out to uh, some of our leaders in the church to pray for those specific requests. So on the back of that Connect card is a great place to do that, as well as, you know, if, if this there's something on your mind, if there's a lot of times we, we need to know if you're interested in something, taking a next step, that's where we want you to put that. Um, those Connect cards will be collected by the ushers as you exit this morning with any tithes and offerings that you may have. You can just drop them right in the basket. If this is your first Sunday with us, we are especially glad that you're here this morning. And we have a special gift that we want to put in your hand. And we'll do that by you taking that Connect card to that back table that says VIP. And we will get that gift for you. A couple announcements going on. You know, I, I think it's appropriate that... Um, Andrew gives me the stuff to say. So if anything I say up here is, is off the wall or sounds funny, I'm just repeating exactly what he tells me to say every Sunday. So calling all boys to men. I mean, calling all men and boys. Next Friday is a camping trip. Uh, we are going camping, and we are excited about this. Last year we did this kind of a spur of the moment thing. This year we've really planned it. And if you are a boy or a man or a man that thinks he's a boy or whatever, we, we want you to participate in this event because it's going to be fun. There's going to be fire and, and there's going to be food. I mean, what could go wrong, right? I mean, this is going to be an awesome time. It is the 19th, which is next Friday. And uh, we want you to be a part of this. If you have somebody, and they don't have to be your son or your kid, but this is a really great opportunity to, to, to bring someone out, to bring, a, you know, the, the dads bring their kids, the dads bring their sons, the men bring, bring someone that doesn't have a dad that wants to participate in this. This is a great opportunity. I'm very grateful for Danny and Peggy to allow us the, the place to do this. It's going to be an off-the-chain experience. They have a lot in store, a lot planned. But we need to know that you want to come because... We are going to feed them. We are going to feed the folks out there. And I would hate for you to have to kill something in order to survive. So we want to know if, if you are interested in being a part of this camping excursion next week. You can go on the website, bridgechurch.cc. You can go to events and you can find camping. You can sign up there so we can get a record of that. Or you can find Trent Wise if you can catch him uh, after service and just let him know that you're, you're planning to attend. We would love to have you guys there. A couple other things. May is just around the corner. It happens to be my favorite month. It's by far the best month. I mean, by far the best month. I mean, you got Mother's Day, of course. You got my birthday. Um, and then Cinco de Mayo is in May. And guys, I'm excited about this because this is a themed Connect Night that we are going to have. And if you haven't been a part of our Connect Nights in the past, you are in for a treat. This is an awesome opportunity for us to gather as a church body, to have fellowship, to have friends just meeting each other. And what even makes it even better this time is it is a themed night. It is a Cinco de Mayo because it's on the 5th of May. And we are going to have a themed 
Connect Night with uh, Cinco de Mayo, bringing your favorite uh, Cinco de Mayo food. Um, and it's going to be an exciting night. It's going to be a great opportunity. And here's another thing that it's a great opportunity for. And we talk a lot about this, but it's inviting somebody. This is a great place for us to come together, not in a normal church setting, and just fellowship and love on each other and, and, and just have a great time. So you don't want to miss that. Cinco de Mayo. And uh, if you're taking notes, May 7th is a good day. Uh, a couple days later, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll appreciate any gifts or anything you want to send my way. <clears throat> Uh, last couple things here, BSM tonight, they are back from their Kentucky trip. A lot to share with you about that. Um, they are excited. Uh, it was a great trip. Uh, we are having that again tonight. BSMK starts at 5. There's also an interest meeting, I think was announced last week. If you are interested in, in your child being a part of the Submerge summer camp, 5 o'clock in the modular right across the way here at 5 o'clock tonight. If you're interested in that, if you have questions about that, we would love to have you. Guys, the last thing I want to mention is that as we return our, our hearts and minds to a, and prepare for worship, this altar is open. This altar is a place where you can come and, and spend some time and, and get on your face and, and, and praise and worship and pray. And, and this is open. And, and as we continue to worship, if you feel the Lord pulling your heart, come forward. This is what this altar is for, and we would love for you to just spend that time with God. So let's stand to our feet and continue to worship this morning.
praise you, Jesus. So, I was going to share with you today about the Israelites and when Joshua was leading them into the promised land where they would have to march around Jericho seven times and then the walls would fall. That was in um, chapter 6 in the Bible of Joshua, chapter 6 of Joshua. But we see in chapter 24, (laughs) the Israelites are needing a reminder of God's faithfulness. And you see here, there's a theme in the songs this week, faithfulness. We didn't even do that on purpose, but, but God did. So I love what it says in Joshua chapter 24, verses 11 through 13, where God had given Joshua a word to remind his people of his faithfulness. It says, when you crossed the Jordan River and came into Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, but I gave you victory over them. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you the land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns you did not build, the towns where you are now living. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. So this tells me if if the Israelites who had seen God work and God move right in front of them, and he, they had, the Israelites had heard of their ancestors who had seen God move. And God sent them reprieve and God rescued them and led them out of Egypt and so, so many other stories. If they saw those things and heard firsthand of those things and still needed a reminder of God's faithfulness, then we do too. And yes, God works maybe in different ways than making the walls fall down, but he still works. But we, we still need reminders because we forget. And so as I'm, I was worshiping with Megan and this wonderful team up here and, and all of y'all, I during this last song especially, I'm just reminded of things that God has done for me. When I wasn't faithful to him, he was faithful to me. So there's your reminder if you need it today. God is faithful and he always will be. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence, you never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come. Sing you. 
we come to you today just humble by your presence, God. I can feel your Holy Spirit moving through this room, God, moving through the people of this congregation. God, and I am just such in awe of who you are and what you've done. God, you have never left us. You have never forsaken us, God. You have been faithful even when we have not, when we haven't opened our Bible in days, God, or, or we haven't thought to pray to you in weeks, God, even when we turn and we ran in the opposite direction. God, you have been standing and waiting for your children to come home. God, and I am just so thankful that I get to call you my Savior. God, and that I get to be such a part, a big part of your plan. God, and that you use tiny old me and the people of this congregation for your glory every day. God, and I ask that as we exit this time of, of singing, God, and we go into diving into your scriptures and learning more about you, God, that you would just open the minds and the hearts of, of the people in this room, God. Allow us to be, to be open vessels for you to pour into, God. I ask that you would just continue to, to bless the people in this room, God. Bless us with your word, God, and with your wisdom. God, I ask that you would just continue to move in this room, God. And I ask that you would just allow us to take the words of, of Pastor Andrew today, God. And I would ask that you would just use him and you would move through them. Allow you to talk through him, God. Allow it not be his words, but yours, God. And just, just enter our hearts, God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, church. Yeah, it's so good to be back with you today. Uh, I was out of place last Sunday as uh, I went with the student ministry here at the church uh, on the mission trip to Kentucky. And I just wanted, I'm going to get into the sermon in just a moment, but I want to take a second just to tell you about how awesome the missions trip was and what God did. You know, I, I'll say this. So the students worked incredibly hard. And, and it's just a testament to the way that you have raised them. And uh, it, no complaining. I mean, we had jobs, some jobs that were pretty cool and pretty fun. And then some jobs that were less glamorous. And uh, the students never complained, never you know, uh, batted an eye, they just jumped right in. But I will say this, even more than the work that got done, uh, the spiritual component was amazing. So I led the devotion that first day, and then every day after that, it was student-led. And I'm not just talking about they read and, you know, our, our daily bread devotional. Nothing wrong with those, but, you know, sometimes you can just read the devotional and, okay, let's pray, and that's it, and, I'm telling you, they had come up with their own uh, study of Scripture, and then they had they shared it, and there was discussion around the room, and it was it was incredible just to hear them talk about the Word of God and bat different ideas back and forth, and and uh, just encourage one another. And so, um, not only did that happen, but also uh, some missionaries came and spoke to us about what God had been doing in their life in the past couple years, and uh, they spoke for a long time, and the students were right there, zeroed in on them, asking questions, and showing them love, and it was so cool because 
uh, it was so cool because their granddaughter was there visiting them, and their granddaughter said, hey, uh, can I go with them tomorrow? And, and you can tell the grandparents are like, well, baby, and they're trying to explain to her, well, baby, they're not here to have fun. They're going to work tomorrow. She's like, I know, I know. I just want to be with them. Can I go be with them? And so we added to the missions team while we were in Kentucky. I mean, I ain't never seen nothing like that. And uh, so that was incredible. And then that last night, there was a night of worship. And uh, just to see those students worshiping and all spread out throughout the auditorium. And then different ones would go to the altar and then they would pray for a while. They would leave the altar and uh, different adults are going up and praying over them. And things are happening. And then at the end of the night, all of them gathered arm in arm, boys on one side, girls on the other. I mean, just right there in the altar crying, just amazing time together. And so it was an awesome trip. And I share with you the, the amazing parts. And then there were some parts that were truly unforgettable, okay? Um, there was a tornado while we were there. Uh, we got over the mountain and we're going down into where we're going to be staying and there was like beep, 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 tornado watch and then we dropped off all the luggage for the boys, dropped off all the luggage for the girls, we met back together, we're going to eat, now all of a sudden there's a tornado warning, all right, it's getting more serious, but we're just kind of looking around at the locals and they ain't scared, so we ain't scared, so we ordered and we sat down and I bet we waited maybe 10, 15 minutes for our food. And y'all, let me tell you about the enemy. <laughs> that hurricane comes up as the food is hot and ready right in front of us. It's been a long day. We've been traveling. I'm hungry. I'm ready to eat. And my meat lover's calzone is hot and ready. And one of the missionaries calls Danny and says, hey, it's getting serious. Y'all better shelter. If God takes me while I'm eating this hot calzone, that's just his will. We'll just have to be okay with God's plan. You know, I'm trying to explain that to Danny as he's pulling me into the restroom. He's like, you're a leader, Pastor Andrew. And so there we all are, uh, the whole, all 22, 23 of us in one women's restroom. <laughs> Stanky. Our food's cooling off. I'm like, you know what, maybe this is not God's will that I be on this trip, you know. <laughs> but it was all good. Tornado passed, no problems, no issues. Then the snow came a couple days later, and then it came back the next day. And it was just, again, truly unforgettable, both in terms of what happened with uh, the weather and in terms of what happened spiritually. And um, I just want to take a moment and, um, and say thank you. To all of you, for the students, for, for the boys and girls you sent on that trip, and, and how awesome they were. I want to say thank you to all the BSM team. Brenda, I know, that's a lot of work. It takes fundraising on the front end, communication, coordination. You got to get a rental van. You got to secure the place to stay, the work to do. And it's just a lot on you. And then uh, Danny and Peggy were on the trip. Rachel was on the trip. Some of the top-notch leaders. And so, church, can we give it up not only for these students, but also for these leaders right here. One of the things that kept happening on the trip is anytime a student would be around me and they'd be working or even during the card games at night, whatever, uh, they would kind of ask, like, uh, is this going to make it in the sermon? Are you going to talk about this in the sermon? And that question kept coming up. And I don't know if they want me to talk about it or they don't want me to talk about it. But I just want to tell you, not everything's going to make it into the sermon. And so the fact that there was a student that kept challenging me to a race. And I said, no, don't do that. Not yet. No, you just wait a couple years. And that student kept chirping a little bit. And here's what I'll say. Everybody wants to beat the big dog, you know. So we had to line them up. And I'm not going to tell you about how I smoked that student in that race. 
And then, yeah, Brenda, thanks for queuing me up for that. Um, here's why I'm not going to say that, because after that, there's this parking lot, and there's some shadows, and it's black asphalt, and in one corner there was some black mud, and I'm running, and let me tell you, I don't know all the, you know, Newton's laws and stuff, but an object in motion wants to remain in motion. And so when you get all of this worked up to top speed, it takes a minute. And I'm trying to slow down, trying to slow down, trying to slow down, and uh, hit some black mud and went down. And God, in his sovereignty and in his blessing on my life, allowed no one to be filming when that happened. But there's a lot of after pictures, and if you want to see them, go to Rachel. She can hook you up. So anyway, had a great time. Hey, listen, I was gone last Sunday, uh, but I do want to go back to something. I I shared this on social media, but I know not all of you have social media. I just want to say thank you to you. To all of you, because two weeks ago, Easter Sunday, for weeks leading up to that, I had challenged you. Hey, would you invite someone? Would you bring an unchurched, unsaved person with you? Would you ask your friends, ask your coworkers, get somebody here? And I want to tell you that on Easter Sunday, just go ahead and get ready to clap and hoop and holler and get excited. On Easter Sunday, we saw 10 people give their life to Jesus. Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. That is what it is all about. That is what it's all about. And some of the conversations I was able to have with those people via text and uh, were, were awesome. And just believing that, uh, that that's going to be a first step. And that there are more steps ahead. So thank you for praying. Thank you for inviting. Thank you for everything you did. Because here's our goal. We want to get as many people to heaven with us as we can, right? Uh, Shame on us if we're saved and we love the Lord and love church and spend time with him. And we don't ever share about the hope and love of Jesus. Like shame on us because if we believe the word of God, it says... That their eternity is a reality and that we spend eternity somewhere. And so we want to tell as many people as possible about Jesus. And so thank you for being a church that invites. Um, Hey, I do, I want to get into the sermon. Before I do, I do have one other thing I want to say. I want to just take a moment to be your pastor, okay? Yesterday, uh, I ran launched an attack against Israel, and everything I read this morning was that the Iron Dome was, you know, pretty much stopped almost 100% of the ballistics missiles that were sent, but y'all, we need to pray for peace in our world. I mean, you see what's going on in various pockets in the world. You see the wars and rumors of wars. You see these different things. Now with Israel, uh, I don't know what will come of this. Hopefully, Everything can be de-escalated, and obviously we want to pray for peace. But whenever you look at end times prophecy, it always centers around what's happening with the Jewish people and what's happening in Jerusalem. And so I just want to encourage you. um, Let's pray. Let's pray for our world. Let's pray for what's happening right now. And, uh, you know, also I'm praying, but Lord, come today. (laughs) I mean, that would be the greatest thing. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But short of that, God, I pray for peace. And we obviously don't want to see World War III. Nobody wants to see that. And and yet there are some troubling things happening in our world. So I just want to encourage you as a church, let's be people of prayer. Amen? Amen, amen. All right. We are in this sermon series called Allowed to ask, and uh, here's what happens a lot of times. It's kind of fun to be up here at the end of service, and people come up and pray with you, and oftentimes people will say things like this, 
man, do you have a microphone in my living room? I mean, holy cow, like the stuff I'm going through, what's going on in my life right now? Pastor, you preached on it today. And sometimes they're exactly right, and I did. And listen, it's, I don't have a microphone, by the way. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And then sometimes they tell me what they heard during my sermon, and I'm like, I didn't preach on that. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking, you know. And so, but it is the Holy Spirit, and he can speak directly in to what is going on in your life. And so sometimes when we have questions, that's the way that they're answered. Other times, though, like during this sermon series, I'm, I'm praying, I'm leaning into the Lord. God, what is it you would have me preach? And yet sometimes I just want to open up the floor and like what questions do you have about faith or maybe you're going through some painful circumstance in your life and you want me to address that or what does God say about this? And so that's what this sermon series is all about. Now, I will say this, you guys surprised me, okay? Y'all surprised me. I've, I've done a sermon series very similar to this. I've been a part of some other ones. And um, it's interesting, all the different questions you get. Like, uh, a lot of times somebody asks about dinosaurs. Did dinosaurs really exist? Or somebody asks about the age of the earth or something like that. And that's cool. You want to talk about that? That's not going to come up naturally a lot of times during the sermon. All right, let's talk about it, you know. And, and this time didn't get any of those questions. But... Uh, i tell you a question that I got a lot, and, uh, and, and let me just say this. So last week, Pastor Ronnie preached on one of the first questions that we got, and it is, does God have a plan for my life, and does God have a plan for humanity, right? So such a, a big, overarching question. Hey, listen, I want to tell you, if you didn't, if you weren't here last Sunday for some reason, I just want to encourage you, go back and listen online you really owe it to yourself. Pastor Ronnie did an incredible job answering that question. He really did. And so since then, we have gotten so many questions. I thought if I don't deal with a couple of these a Sunday, I'll, I'll only preach four of them, and there will be so many questions unanswered, and so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to try to like pick up the pace and answer a couple questions each week. Um, and, and then there are some questions that fit under some umbrellas. So a question that we got quite a few times was, uh, what happens after I die? Like when the moment I die, what, what happens after that? And then got a question, will I know people in heaven? Like when I see my grandma, will I know her in heaven? And then I got the, we also got the question, does my grandma see me here on this earth from heaven? Like, can she look down and see what I'm doing? And, and so here's what I'm going to do. Two weeks from today, I'm going to answer those questions. So all the questions about, like, heaven. It might be some other ones, too, but we'll just kind of see. But that's kind of the umbrella that I'm targeting for two weeks from today. Then also got a lot of questions about <clears throat> um, marriage, marriage. And uh, a little weirds are in here, and intimacy and other things, and my boyfriend and girlfriend and those kinds of things. And so, let me just say this: next week we're going to tackle those. Okay, so I'm going to preach on that topic. And uh, so uh, next week, if you don't have to answer a lot of questions after church, and you have little ears around you, you may want to check them into Bridge Kids. Right? It's it's always a good week to check them into Bridge Kids because. They're getting Jesus on their level over there, but, but next week especially, I just wanted you to have kind of a heads up. That's going to be what I talk about because those were the questions that came in. Now, let me begin today with a disclaimer. Excuse me, a disclaimer. So these are tough questions, and uh, many times they have very specific situations. I, I was sharing with a team member this morning, one of the questions that came in was like, Hey, is, is this a sin? Because I've got a nephew that's dealing with this, and if uh, th that would break my heart. And I, I just understand that oftentimes there's a reason why you're asking the questions. And so I, I don't want to answer them so quickly that it feels flippant, because that's not my heart. And yet I also want to be able to answer these questions thoroughly enough that you feel like you're taking something away. And here's the other thing I know. 
And I want everybody to pay attention to me when I say this. Everything I'll talk about today, can I tell you something? You have an opinion on. You have an opinion. And so here's what I am endeavoring to do. I want to be clear where the Bible's clear, where I'm given an opinion that's mine. I want to try to make sure I always say that. And I know that across this church, to think that we all agree on all these different opinions, that would be really naive of me. And so I just want to encourage you that there are some essential beliefs. There are some things we've got to be together on. Like if you, you, you got to believe Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was fully God and fully man. you got to believe that he died on the cross not because of his own sin, but because of ours, humanity's, right? Like there are some essential beliefs. If you're not together with me on those, we probably can't go on together. There are also some other beliefs that theologians will call those non-essential beliefs. So these are things that you have liberty. I'll give you an example. And this is one I preached on about a year ago. My grandma grew up Baptist, loved the Lord, and she would straight up tell you alcohol is a sin. You ought not never drink. And, and so I grew up like, man, that is taboo. And yet, when we look at the Word of God, like, and, I, and yet I know other Christians, other people that I thought, man, they seem pretty sincere about their faith. They seem to think you can have one or two. And, and so what's true? Well, here's what Scripture says. Scripture says don't get drunk. <clears throat> don't be drunk. And so for like my grandma, well, there's no chance because she would never consume any. And then like for other believers, they say, you know what? No, I have liberty in all things and I can have a little bit. And, and so again, we may not, sorry, brought a little cough back with me from Kentucky as well. So we may not agree on all the opinions. There are some non-essentials. And I just want to encourage you, if you have any questions about anything I say, call me, email me. Let's sit down together because we don't all have to be right there together with the same opinions. There can be liberty in some of these things. But if you get agitated or angered by something I say, please sit down and talk to me and let's look at the Word of God together. Okay, let's dive in. Here's the first question. How do you wait on the Lord to answer your prayer? How do you wait on the Lord to answer your prayers? Uh, I love that question. Let me do a quick poll, okay? Everybody with me? Everybody paying attention? How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and you were hoping that God would answer immediately? Let me see those hands. Yeah. Everybody didn't raise their hand, just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Because anytime I pray, I'm like, Lord, if this is your will, but God, please also do it today by 5 p.m., right? <laughs> we want what we want. We want to win. Yeah. Now, come on, Jesus. And here's another question. I want to ask you to raise your hands on this one. How many of you, you've ever prayed something and you had to wait on God to answer that thing? You had to wait. Oh, yeah. And so for every one of us, and so for every one of us, we know what it means to wait. That God doesn't always answer with a yes. God sometimes answers with a no. And sometimes he says, wait. I did a Google search. Just a quick little search. It said that in the Bible there are 159 verses on waiting. God's got something to say about waiting. We're, we're going to need to wait from time to time. Probably the most recognizable, the most quote-unquote famous verse of those is from Isaiah 40. These two verses, 30 and 31. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In other words, what the scripture is saying is, is that when we wait on the Lord, when we don't do it in our own strength or our own timing, when we will wait on the Lord, there is some stuff that happens. There is some supernatural aid that is rendered to us. There is this worship song, and I absolutely Love it. It's by Maverick City. It's called Wait on You. And many of you probably know it. And if you don't know it, let me just encourage you. 
There are times when I pray and I'm like, God, come on. God, where you at? And I can, I can pray long enough that I begin to feel a little disappointed. You ever been there? I can pray long enough, I begin to feel a little bit angry. God, come on. I'm praying and I'm praying, I'm doing all this, and I'm, I believe you told me to pray for this, and I believe this is where you're leading me, and God, where are you? And I'm telling you, that song has ministered to me so many times. Just put that song on, and you just begin to go for a walk, and it is so amazing how in those moments... God can say, all right, calm down, Andrew, I got you. And you can wait with hope. Lamentations 3.25 says, the Lord is good. What does that next part say? To those who wait for him. Let's try it again. <laughs> the Lord is good. Read this next part with me. To those who wait for him. God's good. Okay, cool. To who? To those who wait for him. To those who wait for him. I heard one pastor say, the only thing that's worse than waiting on God is wishing you would have. The only thing that's worse than waiting on God. You, you guys remember the story of King Saul? King Saul is out in the battlefield, and he's, he, he's in battle, and it's not going super well. And so he says, man, all right, well, Samuel, the prophet, the man of God, he said that he was going to come and, and offer this fire today, this come and offer this sacrifice. And, and he sees his troops beginning to fracture and kind of split off. Some of them are beginning to go home. And Saul's like, oh, man, all right, we can't wait for Samuel any longer. Let me go ahead and take this matter into my own hands. And so he starts offering the sacrifice. And about that time, Samuel comes up and he says, what are you doing? He says, oh, well, you, you had said you would be here today, and you weren't here. And, so, and Samuel basically says, I'm here now. This is a foolish thing that you have done. You got impatient, and you, you, you did this thing in your own time, and that was not God's will. That's not what you were told to do. And if you look at Scripture, that was really the beginning of his downfall. That was kind of the beginning of the end for Saul, all because... He got impatient, all because he didn't want to wait for the Lord any longer. Hey, hear me, church. Is it any wonder in this culture of instant gratification that God would choose to work in us and on us, building patience, building endurance, building a godly character? Is it any wonder that God would use waiting? I mean, if we have to wait for three seconds for internet, you click something on your phone and you're like, what's wrong with this thing? You know, I mean, here we are. We are just so used to immediate gratification, instant. And yet God sometimes says, wait, I, uh, I knew I was going to be preaching on this this weekend. And so this past week, I'm at the bank. And the bank I go to, it has four lanes outside. And I thought, I'm not going to get up. There's no reason, no reason to like stand up, get out of my vehicle, walk inside. I'm going to just go through the drive through And I get there, awesome, perfect. There's four lanes. One of them shut down. There's only one person in each lane. <clears throat> I said, I don't know who was here first. I don't know how long they've been here. I'll just pick the middle lane. So I get behind this white Tahoe. And I'm there. And then two people come up behind me, and each of them chooses that. So I'm in the middle lane. One chooses the outer lane. One chooses the inner lane. And I'm just waiting because I'm going to be good and holy. And, again, I know I'm preaching on this this weekend. And so I'm like, all right, God, I'll just play on my phone for a minute. No big deal. And then the cars that were there when I got there, they leave, and now the cars that this is totally an injustice. The cars that were behind me are now at the tube and they're sending their thing in and I'm still waiting on the white Tahoe. Okay, I'm preaching on this this weekend. No big deal. God, we're cool. And then people came up behind them. And then those people get up to the tube. 
So now I've got my window down. I'm trying to hear, what are they doing? Are they closing a home loan? Or what is happening at my tube? If you drive a white Tahoe and I was behind you this week, I'm mad at you still. (laughs) Here's what I want to promise you. God does not disappoint us in the grand scheme of things. And so if you're waiting, I understand it can be disappointing in the waiting. But when you look at the grand scheme, I love what Pastor Tim Keller said. He, pastor in New York, he's since passed away a couple years ago. He said this, God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. Now that's kind of a mind meld. Let me read that one more time. God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. We serve a God that sits outside of space and time. He sees the beginning from the end. He sees the totality of our life and our family, those that came before us, those that will come after us. God knows all those things. And so here we are. And we're confined to space and time. And all I know is what's happened so far. And my mind is finite. And God's mind is infinite. And so is it possible? Could it be that if even in my disappointment and having to wait, that if I knew what God knew, I would be okay with his timing? God will never disappoint you in the grand scheme of things. Hey, can I tell you something? That gives me hope. That gives me hope because there are some people that I'm praying for right now. I've got some family members that don't know Jesus. They aren't walking with him. And we, I've talked to them. I've been, I'm trying to be faithful to live out my faith in front of them. And yet there are some people that I love and care about deeply. And if they don't, if, if they don't have a relationship with Jesus, I know what that means. And so there are some people I'm praying so hard for them. And it hadn't happened yet. And so here we are in this season of, of waiting. Hey, listen, as a church, God's been so faithful to us to provide this building and this place and this friendship with Dudley Christian. But here we are, and we're praying for a building and land. God, come on. You see us. God, here we are. Look at all we're doing for you. Look And yet, the search continues. The wait is on. God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. Waiting time is not wasted time if you spend it preparing, if you spend it in total devotion to God, if you spend it looking toward heaven. And so I just want to encourage you because I know maybe you raised your hand earlier, yes, I've had to wait. And maybe you're in that season of waiting right now. And I just want to encourage you. God is good. And he loves you. And he's not forgotten you. He's not forsaken you. And I didn't plan today the worship with the sermon and all that. But even what Nicole spoke about earlier with God being faithful. Like what a word. You're not forgotten. All right, this next one I'm going to try to go far more quickly. Is cussing really a sin? And I just want to say, I reworded this one uh, because the way the person asked it was, uh, now we know that all cuss words are made up words and they don't have definitions other than the ones that we're, we as culture ascribe to them. And so is cussing in light of that really a sin? And I'm like, what? <laughs> How did you work out the justification for it in the quest? I mean... Okay, here's what you're asking. Is cussing really a sin? And and here's here's what I would tell you. I get it. I've been around people who are like, Pastor Andrew, I'm military. And if you don't cuss in the military, like immediately, that's weird. It's just the ling. It's the lingo. It's the language. It's just what you do. I I work in a mechanic shop. If I didn't go in tomorrow and use some profanity, like, It would be so weird, and so it's just the thing, but it's not bad. Trust me. Okay? And I've had people from up north, and they're like, it's just how we talk, you know? Like, And and so I I get it. I promise you, I get it. Um, But let me ask you this. 
If you were to go to Walmart this afternoon, and the next aisle over, you just heard somebody ripping and raring and cussing, and you went around the corner, and there was Pastor Ivan. You'd be like, totally makes sense. He told his wife to hush and sit down in service today. <clears throat> but what about if you were to go around the corner and there was Amy Wise? Can I tell you something? I'd be absolutely shocked. I don't even know if Miss Amy knows any cuss words. I'll have to check with Trent later, but I don't know if she knows any. Again, here's what I'll say. Here, here at the bridge, we're just a simple play, and I, I'm a simple guy. And so let's look at the, what, what the Word of God says. Let's just look at that. Whatever the Word of God says, that's what we ought to go with. Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29 says this. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need, and bringing grace to those who listen. Let how much unwholesome talk come out of your mouths? None. Don't let any. Uh, that's a high bar. <laughs> yep. And it's not just talking about cuss words. Let me just go ahead and say this, because some of you, you're like, well, I don't cuss, so I'm good. Cool. Do you gossip? Do you backbite? Do you murmur? Do you, do you talk about how your boss don't know nothing and how you would do a much better, like? So here's the question. When we speak, we need to ask ourselves, do these words build up or do they cut down? And I, I, I get it. Okay, in the question it was, because these words are made up, and yet... There are cultural norms in a culture. Every culture has that. There are some cultures that if you were to wear your shoes in a person's house, that would be very faux pas. And yet, in, and, and I know in some of y'all's houses it would be very faux pas, but there are some people, they don't care. And it's just, it's not a cultural, it's not a cultural norm. But here, we know what cuss words mean. We know. And so... If you go out to that golf course later this afternoon because the Masters is on and you want to get out there and see what you got and you shank a ball to the left and you yell out a four-letter word, <laughs> there's something happening in your heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so there's something happening. So, again, here's the other temptation. I should have put this in the disclaimer. You're like, uh-oh, there he goes again. He's on his high horse. Andrew's acting like he's better than me. No, I'm not. That's why I told you that story earlier about at the bank and how the Lord is working on me with patience, right? And so this is not me looking down on anybody. This is all of us saying, hey, God, you've set a standard. Would you help me? Because I almost don't see any way in the world I could meet it given the people I work around, given the people I'm around, given what I've got going on in my life. And yet, boy, oh boy, what would it look like to be a Daniel in our generation? What would it look like to be somebody who has favor with the leaders but doesn't do what the other people in the culture are doing? All right, next question. This is going to be my last one, okay? I see the time. I'm going to do this one quick-ish. All right. <clears throat> The church puts a lot of emphasis on the Bible. How do we know we can trust it? And so I love that question because one of the things, like even, even in my answer to the last question, I'm like, hey, what does the Bible say? What does Ephesians 4.29 say? All right, that's what we're going with. And I will say things like the Bible is the source of absolute truth. And it is, and I believe that. And, and if you read something in the Bible and you disagree with it, can I just tell you very lovingly, <laughs> you're wrong and the Bible's right. This is the source of truth. And so, okay, in a culture like that, it makes sense to me why people would ask that question. Well, Andrew, how can you be so sure? How can you know? 
And that question, I'll just say this, it is one of Satan's oldest tricks. It's one of his oldest tricks. He wants to get us to question truth. You remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? The serpent comes up beside Eve, and he says, did God really say? And then he says a lie. God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, God didn't say that. But what's the serpent doing? He's trying to get her to question truth. He's trying to chip away at the foundation. And if the foundation crumbles, then everything else crumbles. The word of God is our foundation. It is the source of absolute truth. And so the way that Satan is working and moving now to get us to question truth is something called moral relativism. Moral relativism. I, I, I'm going to give you a definition. It says this, what is morally right is determined by how the majority of people feel. Well, let's take a poll. How does society feel about it? And so that's where we see things like abortion and homosexuality and transgenderism and these other ideologies. We see those beginning to rise to the surface. Why? Because a bunch of people are saying, well, that's fine. That's right. And yet it doesn't matter. You know what that does? That puts truth up to a vote. That's not what we're doing here. How does it line up with the word of God? Because this is the plumb line. When a builder uses a plumb line, what they do is they hold that plumb line up. And if the wall is off or anything's off, it's not the plumb line. It's the thing that's been built. That's what's off. And so it has put truth, moral relativism has put truth up to a vote. If I were to go outside these front doors right here this, this morning and I were to say, y'all, this is crazy. The sky is orange. The sky is orange. Now, don't come over here and look. <laughs> Here's what I know about this church. You guys are loaded down with common sense and y'all, don't, y'all wouldn't just believe anything and everything. I know that. And yet there are so many people in our culture that they're so easily fooled, oh, the sky's orange. And if you can get enough people to say it, then that becomes true. Let me tell you about this Bible. It is incredible. 40 authors, written over 1,500 years. And yet, with all of those authors, written over all that time, it has one theme One coherent theme throughout the whole thing, and that is Jesus. Theologians call it the scarlet thread that runs through the Bible. How in the world? Because it was written by one author, the Holy Spirit. He superintended the writing of these men that wrote the word. I love what Vody Bochum says. Pastor Vody says, I choose to believe the Bible. Because it is a reliable record of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. When we read the word, that's what we see. 1 Peter 1.16 Peter says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter says, This is not a campfire story. This is not something that I heard from my mama and her mama got it from her daddy. And I was there. I saw it. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Who's Theophilus? We don't know. But Luke, who is a doctor, who's an educated man at the time, he says, it hit me 
you know, there's starting to be all these stories about Jesus and his ministry and his miracles and his teaching. I ought to write down everything I remember. And so he says, I, I wrote down an orderly account for you, Theophilus. Verse 4, so that you may know the what? The certainty of the things you have been taught. Vody says it's a reliable collection of historical documents. That's what we've just seen. And now I want to show you this. It's written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. It says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Read this next part with me. Most of whom are still what? Are still alive. You don't believe me? Go ask Uncle Joe. Go ask, you know, all these different, they're still alive. Most of these people, what I'm telling you, I didn't invent, I didn't come up with. Check me out. So listen, I, I know the hour. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm walking away from my notes. <clears throat> so we can trust the Bible. You can know that God wrote a book. He's preserved it through the generations because he loves us, because he wants us to know how to find him and have a relationship with him, because God cares for us. And let me just say this. The Bible's not scared of your questions. Question it. Do your own research. It's amazing. The more archaeological digs the, they, they do, the more they discover, no, there was really a man named Pilate. No, there was really these kings. No, there was really this and that. And the Bible's not scared of your questions. Jesus is not scared of your questions. Question it. Look into it. Research it. I hope that this sermon series piques a curiosity in us. And then we say, God, I don't want to just take Andrew's word for it. I don't want to believe it just because I heard it growing up. God, I want to get these questions answered for myself. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all these precious ones that have asked these questions. And I thank you, God, that honestly, as I'm seeing today, there's more questions than I can answer. But I thank you, Lord, that you are not scared of those questions. That we don't have to try to hide the truth or keep a secret because it's not quite what you said it was. No, God, in every way, you are found faithful. You are proven true. And so, Lord, we love you. We praise you. Our hope is found in you. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Bless them this week. And, Lord, create in us a hunger and a thirst for your word. Pray it on Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hey, church, don't forget, if you uh, want prayer, the prayer team's going to be right here. If you're a first-time guest, make sure you go by the VIP table. God bless you guys. Have a great week.